Oh, hey, it's Dan Blakely from Barry 360 with our weekly look at what Barry's talking about. On this episode, could be a dazzling light show in the sky this week as the annual Perseid meteor shower peaks. Ontario's early on center is one of the best kept secrets in Simcoe County. We unwrap all of the good things it's doing for children and families. And the Barry Library has finally opened its third location, a satellite branch in Holly. We take a look at what it has to offer, what the library on the whole has to offer. There may be some things there that take you by surprise. Surprise. But first, there's been much talk about how police handle calls where mental health is an issue, that officers are not properly equipped to deal with such matters on their own, that a different, more compassionate approach is required. Well, they're giving it a go at the Barry Police Service, pairing Constable Guy Peters with Nicole Barber, a mental health crisis worker from Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre, on what they call a mobile crisis response team, MCERT for short. Barry 360's Ian McLennan sat down with Guy and Nicole to learn more about the work they're doing. Why was it created? What, what, what is it supposed to do? Its intention is to um, provide a better service to those suffering from mental illness, but also somewhat streamline the process on how um, it's managed or handled. So with pairing up a police officer with a crisis worker from the hospital, She's able to do her assessment in the field. You get so much more information being where the person is at rather than bringing the person from their environment to the hospital and trying to... You just get a much clearer, detailed assessment of what a person might need. And Nicole, your role in uh, this program here in terms of you know what you will be doing, would you be contacted then by the police if they feel you need to be brought in? Guy and I travel together in, uh, in our specially marked unit, and if there is a call that's coming through that is identified as mental health or person in crisis, if we are able to respond, we do respond. And I would guess that if there's officers already on scene that feel that uh, MCERT would be helpful then we will respond to that if we are available. Anything. Describe for me, you know, what difference have you made? What, you know, yeah. that might have been different had uh, you yeah. not been called in. Okay, so so there's a potential, for example, that we're responding to a call with someone that I'm already familiar with from my role in the hospital, from the emergency department. So because I've already got that relationship developed with them, I might have the ability to relate to them, de-escalate the situation, remind them of what their supports are, reconnect them with their supports, so that they don't need to go to hospital. Because, you know, maybe we've already been down that road and that's not and we know that that's not what they need in that moment. So I might already have that relationship developed with them or they might be calling 911 because they are in a, in a situation of crisis. But again, it's not hospitalization that they need. I am able to understand what they're going through. I'm able to validate what they're experiencing in that moment. And I might know the resources that would be more ideal for them as opposed to hospital. What do you hope at the end of six months, um, what will be the uh, sort of the metrics you see that say, hey, this this is working? My hope would be that our data will show that we are able to de-escalate a number of calls that otherwise police would just have to apprehend and bring them to hospital. And we're able to provide that support right there in the community, meeting them where they're at, providing the support that they need so that we're reducing um, the need for police to be on scene we're able to respond so that police are better able to respond to the other calls that are happening. And we're able to reduce the, the amount of people that are, that are presenting to the emergency department that aren't really needed to be because they can receive that support in the community. And Guy, from a policing agency, the metrics too, what will the police be looking for at the end of six months? There's a number of, of, of different things. There's the time that uh, it, it takes for police to respond to this nature of call. And it does take quite a bit of time in terms of the whole hospital process. So that means there's less officers available when you're on that call. They're complex. What we're trying to, to do here is you have a police officer who has a certain skill set and you're adding a wonderful skill set that we don't have. And that is someone with several years of experience and tons of training in a completely different way. The best way I can describe it is... As a police officer, we go in and we receive tons of information about something. We filter through all of it and determine what are the facts and issue, very black and white, because we're trying to determine if a criminal offense has taken place, what are the elements of that offense, and do we need to arrest and charge someone. Her mindset is totally different. Her mindset is taking all that information, she's filtering through it like we would to find what is it that I need to, 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 to problem solve, 
but it's more of a therapeutic or a clinical approach to solving the issue than it is to investigate a, a crime. We're hoping that it's a better service to the people that need it. Barry 360's Ian McLennan in conversation with Barry Police Constable Guy Peters and RVH mental health crisis worker Nicole Barber on their newly formed mobile crisis response team. The long-awaited Barry Library branch in Holly opened last week in the plaza at Veterans Drive and Mapleton Avenue, a welcome addition to those in the neighborhood unable to get to the main branch downtown or the other branch in Painswick. Had a chance to talk with Library CEO Lauren Jessup on the eve of the opening about the importance of the Holly branch, how libraries have been able to stay relevant in the internet age, and when we might see more branches in Barry. So, Lauren, you must be very excited. I am very excited. This has been a long time coming. Yeah. And it's not a full-on branch like downtown or Painswick, but very important for the neighborhood nonetheless. For sure. And to be honest, it is pretty similar to Painswick. Um, the only difference really is the size. So most of the stuff that you find at Painswick, you find here. Um, and anything that you can't find here, we can bring from downtown or Painswick. <laughs> so, <laughs> How important is it to this community to have this, this branch here? I think it's really important. We have heard nothing but positive comments um, and excitement from the community. Uh, there's even one little boy who wants to sleep outside on the sidewalk t- tonight so that he can be the first one in. <laughs> but they are very excited. And I think what's really good for this neighborhood is that they can, a lot of them can walk here. There are so many homes um, in behind this plaza and, and around that people will be able to come on foot. And um, there's lots of ample parking. They're, I think they're really excited about the accessibility of it. It's just about getting... Uh, the services to where people are and that's really been our focus for a lot of the things that we have changed about the Barry Public Library in the last you know five or six years is is that accessibility so adding our kiosks in the rec centers and adding this location and making you know we have a new van that we just purchased for um, for our staff to use for outreach so it makes it easier for us to be out in the community where people are and that they don't have to necessarily drive 20 minutes in the traffic, you know, that we all know is prevalent in Barrie to to get to a library location. So that accessibility is key. All right, so downtown, Painswick, Holly, where's next? (laughs) That's a good question. Um, My guess is is the Hewitt uh, Library and, and Community Center will be next. But our master facilities plan shows six library locations in the city. Barrie is growing and um, based on the population, we can support six locations. So, you know, we should probably have one up in the northwest somewhere. Uh, and then there are, of course, the two uh, that are planned in the rec centers in, in Hewitt and in Salem in those those areas that are being developed. Is this number at, at average for a, a city, a municipality the size of Barrie? To have three? Yeah. No. So... Uh, we're pretty under resourced, but we're working on it. <laughs> so, adding little bits of square footage um, here and there. So, there is a, a bit of a standard of 0.7 square feet per capita, and we're not even half of that. How has the library managed to remain relevant with the advent of the internet and, and uh, everything else that we have in, in modern society now? Not everybody is borrowing books from the library anymore. They're getting them online they're not coming to look at an encyclopedia for a school project anymore although it probably would be better than sourcing it on the internet because there's a lot of bad information out there how have libraries managed to keep up you're right that we don't have the encyclopedias and that stuff we don't keep that stuff anymore but what we do have is is popular materials research materials things that that are in pop culture that people are wanting to learn about and know about and um you know a large focus on indigenous authors and and making sure that people have access to those resources to um, educate themselves and um, the other thing is this is a huge um, thing that we noticed during the pandemic is people need access to the internet not everybody has the internet at home or access to a device so if you don't have a computer and you don't have the internet the library is your place to go and really that digital divide just got worse during the pandemic and it was noticeable you know we had people sitting out in the parking lot doing their schoolwork because the branch was inaccessible um during the pandemic and so like it, it, it there's a definite need there for that space and so i think 
you know, yes, we do see a lot of digital um, use of our digital collection. So people are downloading ebooks and audiobooks and they're using the online learning and things that we provide, but they're also coming in. So we need, you know, when we were designing this branch, we said, okay, it's small, but we need chairs. We need chairs and tables for people to come and sit um, to have a meeting, to to work. Like, especially downtown, we see lots of people now, they're on Zoom calls in the library, they're working. Um, and they're doing that remote work from the library. Maybe their internet's not stable at home or, or whatever. So uh, it's certainly changed, but we just keep changing with it. And that's why, you know, we we're making sure that the libraries that we design now are flexible. So the shelving moves, the, you know, that sort of thing so that we can adjust and change as the community changes. Like downtown, we've added um, a new section called creative spaces. So we have a cricket and we have a laser cutter glow forge. Like we have these tools that people might not have access to at home um, because of cost or space or whatever, but we can share it with the community um, in this public space, and I think that's really important. And did you know you can borrow snowshoes and musical instruments, fishing rods and more from the library, not just books and DVDs and video games? Do yourself a favor, drop by Library Branch, check out what it has to offer, get a library card if you don't have one. It's free. Ask for a tour. We didn't even get to the many community programs that are offered for kids and adults. Our thanks to Lauren for opening our eyes just a little bit wider. Take a bit of a break now and invite Amy Oust in from 107.5 Cool FM with a look at the concerts coming up. This is your Cool Concert Listing. Hey there, it's Amy, and here is this week's Cool Concert Listings. Love will be at Echo Beach August 15th. The Imagine Dragons come to the Rogers Center August 22nd. Blue Rodeo with Sarah Harmer comes to the Budweiser stage August 27th. Boy George and the Culture Club hit the Casino Rama stage September 3rd. Post Malone and the 12 Carat Tour will be at the Scotiabank Arena September 20th. And the weekend's new date for his After Hours Till Dawn Tour comes to the Rogers Center September 22nd. This has been your cool concert listings. For details and for ticket information, go to one 1075coolfm.com. Stay up to date at 1075coolfm.com. This is what Barry's talking about from Barry360. I'm Dan Blakely. It's one of the best kept secrets in Simcoe County, and they're getting back up to speed after the pandemic. Ontario Early On Centers continue to offer a safe space for children and their families to socialize and learn from their peers. Barry 360's MJ tracked down Claudine Cousins at Empower Simcoe to get a better idea of what Early On Centers have to offer and how they differ from daycare centers. The Early On Center really is a hub. It's a hub for parents and caregivers of young children. And for first-time visitors or individuals who don't know about the Early On Center, they can expect to meet some truly highly committed and skilled employees or staff that we call facilitators. And they help to introduce anyone who visits the Early On Center to the programming that's available. They help to share ideas, resources, and help them to connect with other families. And the Early On Center is evidence-based, and I think that's really important for people to understand. It's not just a play place. It's a place that is built around the provincial pedagogy of how does learning happen and the four pillars of belonging, engagement, well-being, and expression. And it's not a child care center. Like, this is a place for parents and their children. Absolutely. It's, it's not a child care. It's not, it's not a daycare. It's not a place where you drop your children off and they go about playing all day. This is about families, caregivers, you know, um, having the time to spend with their children in an environment that facilitates their development. And it also allows parents to connect with other parents and, um, and caregivers and to ask questions, to see if there's something that they need to learn and um, take courses that even are specific for, for the caregivers themselves. Now, it does offer a, a, a number of programs. Can you just give me an example of just, just a few of them? Yeah, for sure. So the ages for early on goes up to 
seven, so prenatal up to seven, which is really great. Um, so parents can take courses that are specific to them, um, you know, how to help um, their children interact with each other. And um, we also have programs that take children outside and caregivers into the forest. We have a forest walk walk program. Um, We also have hybrid programs that allow individuals to access the the, um, the program in remotely, which is great. And in collaboration with our partners such as New Path, which is you know, built around mental health and the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, then we are also able to provide training and um, and programming specific to those areas. You know, parent education, shared parent experience, um, topics such as getting ready for kindergarten. Um, you know, even around March break, there's programming. After you guys were closed off for so long, how mm-hmm. great was it to see sort of kids? get back in there and socialize, especially because it's such an important time, though, especially those first few years, socializing yeah. with other children. That's a great question. You know, it's, it's so important for kids of all ages to have the opportunity to socialize with kids their own age, you know, and being able to communicate, share, and just see how each other interact. The interactions between, between kids are something that kids also use in their development. They're able to use that and make decisions around, you know, what's good to do, what's not good to do, and it helps them to transition into school. When you don't have that opportunity to, you know, in a sense, practice some of the behaviors that's needed for when you move on to to school, then kids are they fall behind, and it's um, it doesn't help with their cognitive development. So play allows them, and the early on center allows them to develop cognitively, also gain their independence in in terms of making some decisions. It's also important for you know families and caregivers to connect because they are also have been separated and the opportunity to come together with like-minded individuals is something that is um, very important to their own mental health as well and by you know it comes full circle in terms of the children if your caregivers are well and healthy then your children are too so it works both ways if you want more information about early on centers if you want to register check out empowersimco.ca Our thanks to CEO Claudine Cousins for joining us and letting the secret out. On a clear night, you can see forever, or so they say, and if it's clear Wednesday and Thursday night, we're in for quite a light show from the annual Perseid meteor shower. Our Ian McLennan was able to pull Gary Boyle, also known as the backyard astronomer, away from his sky watching long enough to tell us what to look for and when. Now, the Perseid meteor shower, it's actually been underway since last month, correct? That's correct. Uh, from the, about the middle of July till September 1st, we're actually going through the dusty debris of Comet Swift Tuttle, a comet that rounds the sun every 133 years. And on the peak night of August 11th, into the morning of the 12th, or 12th and 13th, we should see, on average, about 90 meters per hour. I was saying that we're having a full moon, which is the worst time to, to have uh, a moon in, in this case, this full sturgeon moon on that same night. So the numbers will dwindle to about maybe 20 or 30 per hour. Is it the brightness of the moon that's actually going to mess with this show somewhat? Exactly. Uh, just even being in the countryside where I am now, uh, during full moon, uh, it's almost like city conditions. It's it's a natural kind of like pollution rather than in the city. So any the faint new years will be hidden by just the glow of the moon. But still, it's just a wonderful time of year to get a look at the sky, people will be on vacation or campsites, and uh, really even during the full moon, you'll still see some bright ones, so uh, get out if you can and enjoy Mother Nature's greatest show. Between August the 11th into the morning of August 12th, when is the best viewing time? Uh, Pretty well all night long, obviously, when the radiant or the constellation Perseus gets higher in the sky around 2 in the morning, then you get the more umbrella effect. And the constellation is seen in the northeastern sky, just below the W of Cassiopeia. And Perseus looks like an upside-down Y. How often do we see these types of meteor shows? 
You see the media shower, the proceeds, and all major media showers the same time every year because the the dusty debris that's left over for various comets, if the geometry is right, we always plow through this cloud of, of pretty well sand sized particles or even less, or even sometimes larger, the same time every year, just like going around the racetrack and crossing the finish line. So we had the Perseids now, the Geminids in December, and so on. So we know when these uh, do occur. Okay, when we look up at the sky and we see the meteors and we say, oh, look, look, it's a shooting star. What actually are we seeing? Well, it, nowadays it could be anything. Back in the uh, you know, 50, well, 60 years ago, before we even had space satellites, it was natural stuff from space, uh, uh, pieces of the solar system, um, size of, of sand particles or small pebbles making uh, real bright flashes called fireballs. But now we have spent rockets, we have flakes of paint, nuts, bolts, wires. So it could be space junk or it could be natural stuff from the solar system. That's the backyard astronomer Gary Boyle chatting with Barry 360's Ian McLennan about this year's Perseid meteor shower. And we're done for another week. Thanks to Ian and MJ for their contributions and to Matt Ladder for his technical wizardry. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to what Barry's talking about. Maybe rate it, review it. You can also keep up with what Barry's talking about on Facebook and Twitter at Barry360 and on our website, barry360.com. Until next week, I'm Dan Blakely.